All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, please open your Bible to the book of Luke, chapter 1. We'll start from verse 46 to 55. So, uh, Mia, thank you for our worship songs today. And, um, yeah, there's two songs that were new. Uh, the Noel and this Alleluia song. So, uh, there are people who like to sing the classic songs. Uh, they don't like the new songs. And that's great because the old songs have a special meaning in our heart. But uh, I'm, the, I'm the different type. I'm the type that likes new songs. The Bible says, sing a new song to the Lord. And so that's the type I am. So thank you for the two new songs. Uh, but it doesn't mean I don't like the old songs. The old songs are good too. And... Uh, for beginning last week and this week and next week, we are studying the number one Christian, excuse me, the number one Christmas song of all time. It's the first Christmas song ever written. It's the song that we have on the screen in your bulletin and we are studying uh, today. It's known as Mary's song or the Magnificat. Uh, Magnificat is the Latin uh, title because when this is translated from uh, Greek to Latin, it begins with the word glorify. My soul glorifies the Lord. So glorify in Latin is Magnificat. So that's the title. So let's read this song and see what it says to us today. Here we go. Verse 46 to 55. I'll begin, and please join me at verse 51. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is His name. His mercy extends to those who fear Him from generation to generation. Let's read together. He has performed mighty deeds with His arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. The very word of God. Amen. So, uh, this is a Christmas song. What is the Christmas message? Let me tell you the Christmas message. Uh, according to my children, the Christmas message is Jesus is born, we can have presents. That's the Christmas message. But uh, the Christmas message of the Bible is God's only child became humanity so that humans can become the children of God. That's the message. God's one and only Son became a human so that humans can enter the family of God. That's the joy of Christmas. However, that what I just said, the, the message of Christmas, if that should change your life. Now, I didn't hear any amens, hallelujahs, or praise the Lord. That's fine. We're not that kind of church. But in your heart and in your mind, when, when 
the pastor says, God became a man so that man could be united with God. That should transform everything. You see where it says uh, in verse uh, 46, there, my soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God. So Mary is not saying, Mary doesn't say, oh, wow, I'm learning about God and I'm becoming a better person. I'm, peace is growing in my heart and I feel like things are getting better. She doesn't say that. When she says, my soul, my spirit, she is saying, the foundation, the essence, the center of my life rejoices. She is exploding because you don't add Jesus to your life to make it better. Jesus adds you to his family to make his kingdom grow. Does that make sense? You don't take up Christianity. Christianity takes you in. And that means from the inside, you are a new creation. You are born like a new human being. Now, that's Christmas. But, Your experience of Christmas depends on how you view God. Okay? Now let, me, let me flip that around. You can actually say that backwards. Like this. The way God views you depends on how you experience Christmas. Your experience of Christmas depends on how you view God and the opposite, the way God sees you depends on how you experience Christmas. Pastor Chris, what are you talking about? Are you just trying to be cute and clever? Well, I'm trying to show you what this song is talking about. If you were reading, well, as you read, you, you noticed two characters coming out in this song. There's two kinds of people that experience God. That's good. Uh, who are they? Let me show you. Okay? Look at verse... Uh, 48 and he says he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant so there's the humble servant look at verse 50 you know I'll do it sorry verse 50 he extends mercy to those who fear him so verse 48 the humble verse 50 those who fear him now go down to verse 52. 52. He has lifted up the humble. Okay? So there's the humble, those who fear him. And now 53, verse 53. He has filled the hungry with good things. Okay? So that is one character. The one character is the humble, the servant, who fear God. The hungry, okay? Let's look at the other character. Who is the other one? Go back to verse 51, okay? And at the end of verse 51, he has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. So the other one is the proud. On this side, you have the humble. On that side, you have the proud who are in, in their thoughts. Look at verse 52. He has brought down rulers from their thrones. So the proud ruler. 
Now go down to verse 53. The second half of 53. He has sent the rich away empty. Okay? So in verse 51, the proud. Verse 52, the ruler. In verse 53, the rich. That's one person, one character. So here on one side is the humble, hungry person who fears God. On the other side is the rich, proud ruler. Okay? Now how does God view the, each, each one? How does God behave or act towards each one? Well, you can see in verse 48, go back to verse 48, he has been mindful of the humble. He's mindful of the humble. Now, verse 50, look at verse 50. His mercy extends to those who fear him. And now go down to verse 52. Verse 52, he has lifted up the humble. Now, verse 53, he has filled the hungry. So how does God behave or act towards the humble, poor, and hungry? He fills them. He lifts them up. He gives them mercy. Okay? Now, how does he respond to the proud ruler who is rich? In verse 51, he scattered those who are proud. Verse 52, he brought down rulers. In verse 53, he sent the rich away empty. So he brings down the ruler. He scatters the proud and he sends away the rich empty. Right, so what is Mary singing about? She's not singing about white Christmas. She's not singing about jingle bells. She's not singing about Frosty the Snowman or Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. She's singing about God. How do you view God? It depends on how God views you. So, there's two things that we see about God. He is the mighty warrior or he is the merciful savior. To the proud and rich, he's the mighty warrior. He's against them. He brings them down. To the humble and hungry and poor, he is the merciful savior. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, today we're going to talk about one of those things only. Next week, we'll talk about the other. He is a mighty warrior, and he fights against the proud, rich, and powerful. He's a merciful savior who lifts up, he fills up, and he's mindful of the humble, lowly, and poor. Next week, Christmas service, we'll talk about the merciful savior. That's the good news. This week, we'll talk about the mighty warrior. That's the bad news. Okay? Yeah. There's always, good news is, Christmas is good news, but you have to talk about the bad news before you talk about the good news. Okay? If you can't say amen, no problem. So, uh, <laughs> all right. So, look at verse 51. God is against, so, 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 if you are a humble, hungry, poor person who fears God, this is not a sermon for you, okay? On the internet, YouTube, if you love God and you're humble and you fear God, you're hungry, you can turn off the internet now and go on your have a nice Sunday. The rest of you, you can fall asleep, whatever you want, you're okay. <laughs> if you are arrogant, proud, and boastful, yeah, this is for you, all right? So, well, I don't know who you are, but here we go. Uh, look at verse 51. God is against the proud in their innermost thoughts. Yeah. Right? He scattered those who are proud in their innermost thoughts. So, 
This is the person who, who is in a person, a position of power. He's a bucho, a shacho, a, a macho. I don't know. He's, he's <laughs> tall, okay? He's big. And he has authority. He has um, uh, influence. He's a leader, okay? The problem is, he thinks he is in control. It's in his head. Now, he doesn't say, this is, this is my kingdom, this is my castle, it's my world, you are living in it. No, no, no. He doesn't say it. It's in his innermost thoughts. You don't need to say it. It's in your heart. And so, God is saying, ah, be careful now. You think you're in control. And so what he does is he scatters. That word scatter, that's a word from fighting in a war. So when two armies are fighting, the side that's winning is going to get together. They're together and they're strong and they fight together and they can attack from a position of strength. They don't fall apart. The side that is losing... They have to run back, but they can't go back to their home. They can't go back to their base. It's attacked. So they have to run away. They scatter to the countryside, to the mountains, to the caves. They have to run away. They're scattered because they might die. They're afraid. And God says, if you think you are in control and you think that your position, your status, makes you better, be careful. You're losing. And you're going to lose. And it's not the bad guys who are going to get you. It's God who is against you. He scatters the ones who are proud in their innermost thoughts. How do you know you're one of them? Well, look at the way you, you talk. You might not say it out loud, but, you know, it comes out maybe the way you, you speak to, to certain people, the way you, you talk to them. You, you, you say it like uh, you're some kind of father talking to a child, or you say it like you're a, a, an elder person talking to a young one. Or it comes out in, in certain ways. Be careful. Your words will reveal your innermost thoughts. And God is against it. God is against it. But let's go deeper. Let's go deeper. Uh, look at verse 52. You brought down the rulers from their thrones. So this is not people who think they have power or influence. These are people who actually really have power and authority. And he brings them down from their thrones. Okay. Why does he do that? This one, this one, when I was studying this, this really hurt me. Because this one was mostly about me. And it's, it's hardest. This is the person who is in a place of authority. Maybe a teacher. Maybe a coach. Maybe a pastor. And... Or maybe a parent. And they think because of their position, people are there to help him. They're there to serve his purposes. To perform his will. You see, okay, let me, let me take you back to do some Bible, some Bible study. Okay? The whole story of the Bible from Genesis even to Revelation, the whole story, let's build the foundation. The whole story of humans is this. God made humans to give them his authority. He created man and woman together, female and male, to bear his image, to be his ambassador. To bring the will of heaven down to earth. He said, 
Here is creation. Here is the mountains, the rivers, the animals, the birds, the trees, everything. Adam, Eve, I give you my image. I give you my authority. I give you my power. I'm giving you my wisdom. Rule over this earth. Work the ground. Manage the resources. Do this job as my image bearer. Do this under my authority. That's what he gave to our first parents. Stay with me. Stay with me. This is important foundational things about the story of humanity. And he's saying, I'm giving you my authority to use so that heaven's will will be accomplished on earth. What did we do? <laughs> so, here's the problem. If you are in a position of power or authority or influence, great or small, here's your job. Let me just tell you your job. And I'm telling this to me. If you're a mother, a father, a teacher, a manager, a business owner, whoever, you have three things. This is what your power is supposed to do. Number one, provide for those who need something. Provide for those who need. If, if they need money, if they need work, if they need a job, if they need uh, resources, if they need whatever, you, your job is to provide. That's why you're in your position. Second, your job is to protect the weak. There are wolves and there are sheep. You shepherd the sheep and you spear the wolves. Not the other way around. You don't attack the sheep and save the wolves. Your job is to protect the weak. Number three, your job is to pull the weeds. Every situation, every organization, every school, every business has things that get in the way, that don't matter to the people. They're, 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 they're just they just come up naturally. They're like grass, like weeds. Your job is to be the gardener. This is good, this is bad. We keep out the bad. This is necessary, this is unnecessary. We pull out what's unnecessary. We pull the weeds. That's our job. That's why God gives us power, position, authority, influence. To provide the need, protect the weak, and to pull the weeds. The problem is, we let this thing get to our head. So, uh, there's this TV show that I'm watching. It's about the President of the United States. The problem is, the President is a bad person. An evil, evil man. This is not, I'm not talking about the politics right now. I'm just talking about TV. TV, okay? All right, this is not political. TV. All right, so. Um, so in this TV show, the president was from a small town, South Carolina. His father was no one. Mother was nobody. But he was smart. He was hardworking. And he became a politician. He became a congressman long time he's working in government and then he has a chance to become a vice president and so he's maneuvering and manipulating and he actually kills somebody he murders and he becomes a vice president and then the next season he's maneuvering and he's dealing and he's you know uh, what's the word they use um, um, negotiating. That's what it is. He's negotiating and then he kills another person and he becomes the president. Okay? So now, 
In this season, he's the president. He's in the highest seat of power. And he's trying to run the government. Problem is, there's war in Israel, there's homeless, or there's uh, 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 unemployment, you know, there's, there's uh, unrest, there's uh, disease going on. And so, people are against him, they're trying to pull him down, and his power is becoming undone. So here's what I wanted to say. I say all of that to say this. He realizes something. And he's talking to us, the audience, and he says, the President of the United States should be the leader of the free world. But as the President, I realize freedom is an illusion. I'm the president, the, the strongest, most powerful, free, democratic country, most influential country in the world, superpower. I should have all this freedom, but I realize now that I have the power, I really have no freedom as the president. And it's not everybody trying to serve me. I'm supposed to serve everybody else. Freedom is an illusion. Here's the Christmas message for power. Okay? The way that you use your power is you give it away as much as possible. You give out your power. You generously pour out your power, your strength, your ability, your influence. You give it away. That's how you use your power. Protect, provide, and pull the weeds. Otherwise, God is against you. He will bring down the rulers from their seats. He scatters the proud in their innermost thoughts. He brings down the rulers from their thrones. And finally, in verse 53, look at verse 53. He sent the rich away empty. Empty of what? Well, he fills the hungry with good things. He sends away the rich hungry. So he leaves the rich empty. So here's Jesus. He has the power to make stones into bread. He's God. He can, he can just do that. He can walk on the water. He can you know, heal the blind. He can take stones and turn it into bread. That's what Satan said. And so Satan says, Jesus, if you're the Son of God, make these stones become bread. Jesus says, no, I'm not here for that. So here's Jesus. He doesn't feed himself. He takes bread and he feeds thousands of people, right? He feeds thousands. So here is Jesus, the Christmas story. The man who can feed himself says, no, I'm going to feed others. I'm going to give. I'm going to use the power to help as many as I can. So there's this, uh, there's this proverb, for those of you who are Japanese, I don't know if you know this proverb, the English speakers probably know. Do you know this one? Give a man a fish and he'll eat for one day. If you teach the man to fish, he'll eat forever. Do you know this? Okay. Okay. So that's not that's a good proverb, good expression. Let me teach you a better one. Okay. All right. I have to I wrote it down. Okay. So <laughs> All right. Here it is. This is the the gospel proverb. Here it is. Feed yourself and you end up more hungry. Feed the poor, you'll never go hungry again. Right? Why? Because he sends the rich away empty. And you know this. I know this. The more I eat, the more hungry I get. Right? 
Can't say amen. You need to say ouch. Right? Yeah, right. I see that hand. <laughs> I'll pray with you. <laughs> no, it's true. You feed yourself, you feed yourself, and for some reason, you're never satisfied. God is against the self-satisfied. God is against them. The rich are the ones who can feed themselves. The poor, not so much. Who are the poor? Let me tell you. The poor is a person who knows. Look, I, I can't help myself. I can't feed myself. So, I have no problem asking for help. Look, I, if, if I can work... If I can, and if I have ability to, to, to earn money to buy food, I will work. But if I have no, no ability, if I have no resources, if I have no connection, I can't, I can't help myself. So I will ask you for help. That's, no, that's not a problem. The poor person understands I have nothing about myself that I can use to help myself. So I need help not from in myself, I need help from outside myself. That's a poor person, right? The Bible doesn't always only talk about physical poverty. It's not only talking about material poverty. The Bible is always, always talking about both material poverty and spiritual poverty. Okay? There's physical poverty and then there's metaphysical poor. So the, Jesus says this, Blessed are who? The poor in spirit. The poor in spirit. We know. You know. I can't help myself spiritually. I can't save myself spiritually. I have nothing in myself to make myself better. I need something outside of myself spiritually. Blessed are you because you are hungry. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for the kingdom of God for they will be filled. It's Matthew chapter 5. Mary understands. And Mary sings, God, I'm just a 15-year-old girl, poor, little educated, still not married, but you fulfilled a promise. I'm humble. I'm, I'm a servant. I'm, I'm, I'm not a queen. I'm not a princess. I'm just the poorest of the poor in the smallest, smallest town. And you fill me with good things. You saved me. See, that's what she's saying. She says, God, my Savior. The poor understand. If God is not my Savior, I'm lost. The rich? That's the problem. That's the rich. The spiritual middle class or rich. The spiritual people who can save themselves, who can, who can read and improve themselves, who can provide their own help, self-help. Now, nah, God is looking for the poor in spirit because he will send away the rich empty-handed. Well, that's the bad news. If you're spiritually rich, if you're proud in your innermost thoughts, if you have position and power and you're using it for yourself, God is a mighty warrior. But the good news is, God is a merciful Savior. So let's preview next week. Just one little thing. One little thing. Mary calls God my Savior. Holy is His name. She's this little girl, and she understands. I'm going to be the mother of God. <laughs> she says, all generations will call me blessed. Now, um, Protestant Christians, we, we don't like that. 
Mary is the mother of God? How does that work? Okay, but we have to, we have to accept that she is special. Mary is a special, special woman. And we have to acknowledge that. But then the non-Protestants, the Catholics and the, the Orthodox, they have to understand too, Mary isn't perfect. Because Mary says, God is my Savior. A perfect person does not need a Savior, right? So she understands, I'm just a sinner in need of a Savior. If you can say that, if you can admit that, if you can look in the mirror and say, you need God to save you. You can say that, here's how God sees you. You're a poor, humble servant. And to the poor, humble, hungry servant, he is a merciful savior. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Uh, would you pray with me? God, um, I, I want to experience the Christmas that Mary experienced. I want that, Lord. Um, I want to, to sing a song like Mary sang. I want the words of all the songs that we sing to come from my heart and my soul, my spirit. I want to exalt the Lord. I want to rejoice like Mary did. God, I stand with my brothers and my sisters. And Lord, uh, please forgive our pride. Please forgive our arrogance, our laziness, our half-heartedness towards you. Please forgive us for our arrogance towards others. And Lord, we want to come humbly to your throne to receive forgiveness, joy, and hope, to receive a new relationship through Jesus Christ. So God, we, we, we do that, we, we, we pray for it, we ask for it, and we know that you love those who will confess humbly, Lord God. So uh, thank you, Lord. We pray for peace, we pray for joy, we pray for the hope to be born, Lord God, uh, even today. For this is our prayer, in Jesus' name, amen.